online certification? Which one is more important? That's one. And secondly, sir, do you completely agree that technology can take over the workspace? So online or offline certification, which one is more important? That's the first question here. Uh, I think I already, I already mentioned at the time that it doesn't really matter. Uh, what is important is the body of knowledge. As far as I'm concerned, um, it is what you take in. Either you're taking, you, either you're acquiring certification offline. Offline would mean uh, classroom, I guess, or online. It doesn't really matter at this age and time. What is more important for me is that you have knowledge and you have those skills. So when I was doing my MBA, um, I got to a point that work became so much that I couldn't finish when I needed to finish. And a lot of people were saying, uh, you, are, you are good at it. Just finish anyhow. I said, no. It is important. Getting the certificate is as important as the body of knowledge I will get. So because of that, I paused for about one and a half years. I went back when I had more time to, get, to do it properly. Mm -hmm. So for me, the knowledge you are getting out of it is it much important. more important than the certificate. You can get the certificate and not be able to apply the knowledge. Mm. So what is most important is, is, the, is, the, is, is, the, is the knowledge. The knowledge. So and the second question yeah. is... Do you completely agree that technology can take over the workspace? Well, what we say is that the nature of work will be changing. It's changing. So what we do today, especially if, you're, if what you do is repetitive, if it is um, transactional, it's repetitive, it's tasking, it's likely that robots will take it over. However, jobs, the nature of them will be keep changing. So somebody is going to manage that robot. So if you are smart, you, are, you acquire more skills. Know more about those robots so that you can always have a relevant job. Yeah. That, that is, it, there will never, I don't think there will ever be a time that human beings will not be required. Okay. Especially when it comes to emotional intelligence, when it comes to understanding people. As of now, technology has not gotten there. Technology is likely to get there soon. I, I believe we're going to acquire the capabilities for technology to actually read your emotions. However, even at that time, there will always be a place for humans. All right, fantastic. Well said. Uh, this, I'm guessing, is for Fulu, and it says, is it possible, and how possible is it, to manage uh, more than two or more talents and passion? Is it possible, or how possible is it, to manage... Um, several skill sets. Mm -hmm. is, is that, is that several sort of, talents. Several talents and yeah, passion. And passion. Um, it's completely possible. Um, great advice I was given by one of my cousins um, when I was trying to figure out what I would do after leaving my father's law firm because I left the firm without actually having another job. That's also something you should know. It was a complete leap in the dark. And I left because it, it was getting very hard for me to practice law because um, I wasn't happy. I didn't realize that at the same time that I was working or at the same time that I've been studying all that time, my talents were always engaged. I was always in a musical, a play, um, involved in a film of some sort. Whatever extracurricular thing was happening on campus or around school, I found a way to be a part of. So I'd always been balanced that way. But when I started working, um, I found that that balance was missing. So in trying to recapture that because I, I then went to find a dance troupe to dance with how many people know the actor or the actors um ibrahim suleiman and linda Geoffo? yes so captain quest um ibro gave me my first break in nigeria i guess in entertainment it was dancing i was dancing with him the you know i used to leave the law firm for lunch sneak out to unilag go and dance there and come back and it was while I was doing this and finding that that made me so happy that I made the decision to leave the firm because I was also making hair and skincare products. So I was like, well, I will not need to ask my father for cash unless they are throwing me out of this house and I'll find an auntie to leverage with. I will be able to put money in my pocket while I figure out what I really want to do. I was prepared for the worst case scenario, right? And when you are trying to manage your, your different gifts, you're not going to get it 100% right. Everything is 2020 that I'm telling you. I'm looking backwards and saying, oh, because I added this and this, a lot of it was done on blind faith. I'll be honest with you. 
I took risks, but I tried to take calculated risks. I understood that for me to get away with this bold move of telling my father I'm not working with him, but not having a regular job, I, money had to come in. I knew that I could use my hands because I'd spent the last year, two years, studying everything, natural hair care, skin care. I understood that the raw materials were nearby and I could sell to a small group of people that I was already explaining the benefits of shea butter. People say, I bought Ori, will it not make you black? I'm like, no, it doesn't. If it's darkening you, it's because people in the markets are mixing it with cooking oil. So it is what? Frying your skin when you're outside which means you've got to check the source of where you get it. I was adding value to people's lives. I took something that I was able to do, which is use my brain to learn, and I'm very good at whatever it is you put in front of me, and assimilating information. It took a while to learn that, to now say, okay, yes, what would people say? My, my friends were, you know, they have really wealthy parents, they were bowling out, great lives. They, some people that have just finished from university already had apartments and flats. It's very easy to put yourself under pressure and say, ah, how my, how my, I knew people that got into credit card fraud in the UK. I knew people that served jail time for doing it. I knew people that were bawling out and nobody ever caught them till today. I know them. But you have to be aware of who you are and what it is you want to achieve. So the advice my cousin gave to me was write down, which is why I asked you to do, write down what you love, what you are good at, and what's putting food on the table. There's a link somewhere. There's a story somewhere you're supposed to tell people because no other human being occupies the same space on earth that you do. Mm -hmm. So you have a unique perspective and point. So that's the best advice I can give, which is write it down, make it plain on paper, and continue to connect the dots and develop the talents. Because talent is nothing. Skill is everything. Mm. Talent mm -hmm. is busking at the side of the road. Skill is knowing how to apply that and upgrading yourself and learning. So any opportunities to learn more about sound design, pay for it. Nigerian films need better sound design. It's true that. Us back. True. So. True. Completely agree. All right. Uh, this is for uh, Dr. Peter. It says, uh, "I must say that I was really blessed by all you have said, but sir, number one, how do I find my purpose? I have been asking this for quite a long time, and the answers haven't been helping me at all. At some point, I feel I'm just wasting my time. Please, sir, how do I find my purpose?" And uh, the second question says. Please, how do I find my mentor? Do I just look at someone nice, kind, or beautiful, slash handsome, and pick either of them as my mentor? Okay, let's start from the second one. How do you find a mentor? So you need to have discovered your, your purpose. You need to have discovered your goal or your aspirations. What is it that you want to achieve? Your mentor is simply somebody that has done that successfully. So it's not about the looks. It's not about the bank account. It's not about anything of such. It's about what this person has done before. Has this person done this successfully? Are there things I can, are there one or two things I can learn from this person? So that is the way you identify a mentor. Right? Then, um, how do you discover your purpose? There are a few pointers. There are usually a few indications. What is it that you care about? What is it that comes to you naturally? Uh, what is it that you are not happy about at times. So, I, we just add now that the Nigerian uh, movie industry needs better sound. You, it, that might be your purpose. You, you just can't sit with that quality of sound. You might, be, you might have a calling in that direction. So, there are a number of, a number of um, indicators. Uh, what is it that comes naturally to you? What is it that when you do that, that thing, you, you lose sense of time? Even when people don't pay you, you just love doing it. No time ceases to be when you engage in that activity. What is it? You know, then um, ultimately, ultimately, uh, Psalm 100 verse 3 says it is God that created us. We did not create ourselves. Right? We are a sheep. We are sheep in his pasture. It is God that created you. You need to ask him questions. And uh, don't wait until when you need to get a job before you start asking God questions. Don't wait until you need to marry before you start asking God questions. God is interested in everything you do. If you can ask him for guidance, he's willing to guide you. So I've given you two uh, solutions. There's the, the, there's the spiritual dimension to it. Then there are physical indicators that can help you identify your purpose. Fantastic. Well answered. All right, this one I find really interesting, and I guess any of you can answer this. It says, um, you've got a passion for something, you learn it, start getting paid for it, 
and somehow you lose interest. Why and what do you do? That's the first one. And the second one says, why is it that sometimes you know what to do, how to do it, but somehow you don't do it? So let's start from the first one. You've got passion for something, you learn, start getting paid for it, and somehow you lose interest. Why and what do you do? I think to rekindle interest. Um, if you're losing interest, um, it's most likely because for some reason what you're doing is not challenging you anymore. You're not learning. When you stop learning, when you plateau, it becomes monotone. Your brain and your heart disengage from what it is that you're doing. It has short-circuited. You know how to do it with your eyes closed. So it means that there's a challenge somewhere that you need to find. There's something else. It may be learning an entirely new skill. It may be moving up a level or two. But don't sit in that place of comfort. Then the second part was... Second one. Why is it that sometimes you know what to do, how to do it, but somehow you don't do it? Somehow you don't do what you know, what you should, and how you should do. Um, most times it's probably fear. A fear of, I know this, this is how it should be, this is how it should go. And then there's a small voice that says, but what if you mess up? What if it all falls apart? So we do, um, we become ostriches and we stick our heads in the sand. Which is why I said from the beginning, a lot of you already know what you should be doing. I'm just saying have the courage to jump. And the only reason I came here to talk a lot of long talk to share with you is because I've been jumping like a frog through, through my career. Um, I didn't study. I didn't study what I'm doing now. Along the path I have, my first job, I managed to convince my employers to pay for me to go to the Pan-African University, along with other people, because they're leveraging on random things. I better leverage for your education. Be sharp. It doesn't just benefit me. It benefits the station, because you have more educated presenters. And for me, that I'd invested so much, my father had invested so much in education, and the studying, the qualification I did in the UK, I took out a loan to pay for that, that I'm still paying for till today. Because I said, well, if I'm going to take out money for anything, my education, that makes sense to me. That's lifelong investment. Whether or not I end up using this thing, I'm learning from it. And one of the most important lessons is, if you don't have to take money from a bank, don't take money from a bank. I tell you this for free. It is better for you to swallow your pride and leverage family members, uncles and aunties, complete with repayment plan or oh, don't go and collect money and think you're not going to pay it back. That's what the bank taught me is accountability. Um, but if you're not leaping when you know you should leap, you're afraid. And you're afraid because you feel like you won't be caught. But if you have confidence in, you need to develop confidence in who you are, what you can do. And if you're prayerful, if you're a child of God and you believe that, he's got you anyways. Sink or swim, he's got you. Whatever happens, even if you're not supposed to succeed at that thing, better fail fast. Because if you do it quickly now, you can get over that hump and achieve something later. Deep. Very deep, if you, if you ask me. I learned some of us have questions I want to ask verbally, not written down. So, okay, Victor. Can we get him a mic, please, so he could ask? Okay, I'll just give you a mic. So, um, thank you, Dr. Peters. Um, my question is a bit um, technical. Like, So why... Talking, you said something that um, most times some um, people don't know what's in your head. The so uh, during the course of the presentation, everything it's as if um, you were in my head. Like you say, do this um, is what either what I'm doing or what I want to do in the nearest two three weeks. Do this is either what I did, and um, to this point, I still feel like well, I'm not doing enough, I take up like um, different professional courses, like back to back to back. I do it concurrently. But I still feel like um, I'm not doing enough. So I want to ask this question first, that um, when you were about 27, 20, 29, where were you? I mean, career, where were you? That is question one. And the second question is, at what point in your life did you feel like, okay, um, okay, no, we've, uh, we cannot be okay though, but you feel like, okay, at this point, I can say I've um, achieved something. Okay, I'm doing what I love to do. Like, for example, I, I, I want to be um, either a, a consultant at the same time, a CFO, CEO, or COO of top organization. So, at what point do you feel like, okay, I'm on the path? Like, this place, in the next five, ten years, I'm getting to where I want to get to. So at 28, 
where were you? And at what age did you break into that level? You feel like, okay, I'm here. I know where I'm going. Wow. <laughs> so at, um, at 28, I think I was already a manager of people. Uh, let me start from this. We all have our parts. And no two parts can ever be the same. Uh, but some things are constant. For anybody that's going to be successful, you need to constantly have something you are pursuing. You must never rest on your horse. There must be something out there. So I've worked for close to two decades. Uh, I still have dreams. I'm a CEO. In fact, I'm a group CEO. But there are still things I'm pursuing, both on the personal level and then at the corporate level. You must continue to learn. You must never get to that point where you feel you have actually arrived. If you remember Solomon, Solomon began to misbehave when he told himself that he had achieved what he wanted to achieve. He wanted to build a house for himself. He wanted to build a house for the Lord. When he achieved those two things, then he had enough time to begin to acquire concubines. Right? And that was where he missed it. So you should never get to that point where you think you have actually arrived. There must always be something you are pursuing. There must always be something you are growing. I was fortunate to ask myself to think through life at an early stage. So I realized that there was no end. Okay, so I wanted to go to school. After school, I said, what next? I would like to get a job. After getting the job, what next? I would like to get to the top of my career. After that, what next? And you see that actually there is no end. There is no end. What is important that you continue to grow. You will continue to achieve. And as you achieve, you celebrate it. Give yourself some respite. Be happy. Yes, you have achieved this. But immediately create another goal for yourself. Continue to have tests for, for achievements. So it's good. And I'm happy that you said uh, you have multiple skills. And you're pursuing certain questions concurrently. They will all come to bear. There's no knowledge that is lost. All right? Even if it's just about somebody is talking with you and you can, and you can relate with it, that is enough. You are not, at, at least you have, you have knowledge, you have an idea about different things. I was, in the last two weeks, I've had to interview some, um, some IT technical guys. I'm not an IT technical person, but you will hardly know because I will use your terms, I will use your concepts, because I've read about them. All right? So it's, it's quite important. And by the way, I would like to mention this. It's, it's a bit unrelated. In the course of those interviews, I met with a young guy that is just 31. Right? At the moment, he's, he's earning 750,000 net. And he's asking me to pay him 900,000 net per month. Oh, I should forget about it. It's about the value he knows he's going to bring to the table. He has developed himself to that level. And he knows what, he's sure of what he can bring. And he's sure of what it, what it should attract. So let's continue to build ourselves. Right? The opportunities we open. He said time and chance happen to them all. But are you prepared for that chance? Are you prepared for that opportunity? Focus on preparation. Focus on being ready. So that you can make good of the opportunities that come. Time and chance will happen. God will create chances for you. But will you be ready for that chance? That is what is important. Okay. Um, good afternoon, um, Mr. Akindeju and uh, Ms. Folu. Okay, so um, this question is actually directed to Ms. Folu. Um, I'm a barrister, just uh, like, like uh, as you are. So I'm so inspired by all the things that you've said today. Okay, my question is like in two parts, so, or, or three. Though you've answered one in one of um, your talks. So, so, um, so, so the second part is, I just want to be more specific. Like, how did you uh, transcend from uh, being a barrister and solicitor of, of Nigeria to being a media personality? You know, like. At, specifically yeah, what specifically, I did. Yeah, what you did. Okay. Uh, that's one. And then the second part of the question is, okay, so as, okay, as, as a person, <laughs> I, 
which is one of the things I, 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 like to, I like to do. I'm currently a lawyer. I'm trying to um, transcend to be a, a media entrepreneur um, and trying to sell contents and all this and through be it music, um, social media concept, contents and script writing and all that. So my, so my point is, I, I've, I've noticed that it takes a while for people to really, really take you like, okay, they want to you know, have you to get something done. So in my mind, I was like, okay, maybe if I take these contents and I do them on my own, I do them as my own personal project. I am also a certified project manager. I take them as a personal project. I do them on my own, and they see it, and I use that to, uh, you know, pitch to them. Perhaps this could, this could be something they could consider, and I want to. So the second question now comes in is, how do you uh, pitch yourself in a way to people? Okay. So the first thing I did, how I, I left um, law and gone into media was after my cousin gave me that advice, write down what you love, was putting food on the table, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I was like, well, I'm making money doing hair and skincare stuff. It was small money, but it was there. And predominantly why women predominantly were coming to buy this stuff from me is because of how, what I was projecting. I was projecting an African aesthetic. It was very deliberate. It was very purposeful. The other thing as well that I put together, I love to travel because I was fortunate enough young to be able to shuttle between countries. I was like, and I would notice that at every immigration line, wherever I went in the world, wherever I met, you know, after talking, they'd be like, oh, you're Nigerian. And, you know, and everyone takes a minute. Oh, you're different to other Nigerians. I look at them. How many Nigerians have you met? At the time, I was like, I come from a country of over 180 million people. So what's to say that there aren't several people who are like me? What do you know about where I'm from? So I was like, okay, I, want to, I like to travel. I like to project positively an African image, but I want other people to know about this African image. So while I was working at the firm and in between when I quit, I started creating the idea for a travel show. I was like, I want to travel African cities, contemporary cities, and show people what young people do in Africa. Because I was tired of, oh, do you, do you have a pet giraffe? Yes, he lives in my backyard. What are you saying? What are you, I, you know, like I didn't grow up with wild animals, like you people out here in the country. I was like, countryside smells like poop. It just smells like cow poop. I didn't know that. I'm a city girl. It's Lagos I'm from. So all of, I, and I realized it wasn't people trying to be racist. It's not people trying to be funny. I mean, there's some people who are always trying to be funny. But it's ignorance, a lack of knowledge. And I was like, okay, let me just show people what we do. We're like everybody else. That's how the new Africa came about. It just wasn't called that at the beginning. So I took that idea. Another friend of mine, Chikiaka, actually was helping me because um, he also likes to travel. So he wrote down a couple of things. You know, we heard that Kenya Airways might be interested. We're like, ah, let's wrangle. Who do we know? What you know, ask a lot of questions. See, things fall out when you ask questions. When you stay silent is when you, you will just stay in your own cocoon of misery. Oh, no, but there's no help. There's no, you don't know. If you don't open your mouth and speak, help can't come and find you. It won't find you in a dark hole somewhere. You've got to speak out. So um, we did this. And because my cousin knew that I was trying to also figure out how to get full-time pay, part-time work, because I no longer work for the father's law firm. Yes, I was making small hair and, you know, hair cream money. But I was like, I need money. And one of my cousins, Koch, was working on radio at the time. He was working at Beat FM. So I said, well, if I look at what are all the things I've done to my life? Every time I model, they'll say, come on, host something here. I was like, I can't do this presenting work. Let me try my hand. And that's what I did. I didn't know I was going to get it. Beat FM told me straight away, they're like, mm, we don't have space for you here. There's no time, no space. But because I was already in this... I've created a show. What's the cost of doing this show? No one has done this show before, so how did I come up with a budget? I said, well, go online. How much is flights from Lagos to Nairobi? This is the cost. Write it down. How many people do I think I'll need to make it? I've never produced anything before. But you ask questions. You go online, and you put together, to the best of your own ability and knowledge at the time, what is a document that shows you have thought about how you want to execute it. And that if push comes to shove, just joining on to your second question, you are willing to put your own money where your mouth is. Nobody wants to give you money or give you a job if you cannot invest in yourself or your own idea. If you have an idea or something you want to create that you wouldn't pay money for, why on God's green earth should somebody else put their own money in that? If you're not willing to stay up at night to make sure that your own idea succeeds, I'm not going to pay money for you to use me as guinea pig. That's where this whole thing of they don't want to invest in you until they see you come through. Because also with education, I said with education, with, infer, with um, entertainment, developing and growing with access to technology, a lot more people can wake up and say, I can do things that they may not necessarily follow through with. How many times have you guys asked somebody to create, 
whether it's document or logo or something, I'll do it, I'll do it, I'll do it. One month later, one year later, guy, oh guy, where is my, I'm busy. Mm -mm. It happens too often, so big corporations are not interested in just shelling out cash because there's a dime a dozen people who say they want to present, who say they want to do this. I came up with that idea, I put it forward, Beat FM didn't hire me, Inspiration FM heard it and said, well, if you can get a sponsor, then maybe you can come on air and be doing this thing. But it was a radio presenter on radio at Inspiration at the time, Shola Thompson, that was in the meeting that said, come, let's just chat. I went into the studio, we're chatting in the studio. Next thing, chat on to, oh, I'm going to switch on the mic, let's chat on air. I was a bit tensed. What do you mean? This was not my plan, but opportunity, co, co, co. Sometimes you just leap. So I said, what's the worst that's going to happen? Do not allow me to enter this office again. It's okay. I do not cuckoo have access before. So we switched on the mic, bantered for about 30 minutes. I mean, time flew. And then he was like, okay, come back tomorrow. That's how I got my first job. That's literally eight, like that's as nitty gritty as I can give you without saying the cost of the flights from Kenya to here. And it was following that MTV were doing a VJ search in 2012. Um, at the time, I was still on radio, and I'd only been there for a few months. And again, I looked at it. I said, ah, don't be that person that will sit in your house and say, oh, this thing, I can do it better than you. You'll be bad-mouthing people. This guy, look at rubbish-looking boy. What is he wearing? What? Put your money where your mouth is. And it was very tough for me because on the one hand, the cutoff age, that was, I was turning, I, was, I think cutoff age was 24, or 23 or something, and I was just turning that cutoff age. So I thought, oh, they may not even accept me. And it's very easy to think that and not even apply. And just be like, well, man, it's tough. Which means that I'm already the last of the category they're interested in. Which means I don't spoil finish as far as they're concerned. And understanding that media is very ageist. Understanding that a society already, already is very ageist, especially towards women. All these things can tell you, just give up. That mad voice inside that people say, yeah, a bit strange. That's your superpower. Use it. That colo that's like, do you know what? It's okay, it's okay. When Noah was building Ark, you know they rain now. Build, be building. Because I did it and they gave me a shot. And I didn't win the VJ search. I didn't win. And he's won. And on top of it, he's winning. Listen, ask him till today, all of us, we talk about it. I was the local driver. My father that did not even want me to be doing this thing, that I wake up every morning. Mom, she just grumble in the corner. Now she's my biggest supporter. I just hear her. Other children are helping parents build their empire. You are here. What are you doing? Radio announcing. Do you know what radio announcer is? The time is now 12 noon. That's radio announcer. That's what my parents felt I was doing. That's, they were like, what? We well, paid thousands of pounds on your head. Rubbish. People from church were coming to jam me on the streets because I was running away from church. What are you doing? Your parents, I said, first of all, excuse me, ma, I don't know you. You, I don't know. You don't know the conversations my parents and I are having. You don't know the conversations me and my God are having. Don't meet me on the road. And because you mean well, start throwing your own concerns and projections onto me. It is very easy to accept somebody else's fears as your own. Don't do it. Don't do it. That is somebody else's life experience, somebody else's fear. It is not yet yours until you've experienced it. That has nothing to do with you. Understand where they are coming from. Because I had to also learn that my parents are only doing this because they love me. This is not, oh, you know, forget all this rubbish. It's not because they want me to be sad. They want me to do well, but they don't know that I'm going to do well until I start showing them that I don't need to ask for money, that I've thought about how I want to make this money, that I've looked at the top people in my field, not just in Nigeria, which at the time I felt was Ike Osaki Odua, and now Ike and I is like my big bro. We talk about everything all the time. But Ryan Seacrest, I said, here's the templates for what exists globally. Here's what I want to do. I want to be on radio, television, online. Hustle, hustle. So when MTV came, I thought, this is my time. I've arrived. I must win this. And when I didn't win, I was crushed. I felt cheated, hard done by, ignored. I was queried at the station. They said, how can you go? Something that I told my guard, the topo, that by the way, sir, I'm pursuing my dreams. He said, oh, best of luck. I got somebody to cover my shift. But because somebody else was covering that shift, he was the same person that issued query on my head. Imagine how you would feel. At that point, that's a great time to give up, bar. And I was like, it's okay. I went and had something um, uh, on myself that reminded me that, listen, for we walk by faith and not by sight. I was like, I may not have won this, but I know that this thing, something is coming in front. And a few years later, after, and Danny called me 
that same year to say, oh, we saw you auditioning for this. Try your luck. I said, yes, let me try. I got in there. Radio station said, sorry, you can't do both, even though I asked. I said, no problem. I will give this up in favor of learning a new skill. The, the amount of work that was required of me was unheard of. And I told my father, I said, well, at least termination notice, wait, two weeks notice to terminate? I say, in two weeks, I'll probably be gone. But you know what? Let me be here for two weeks. I write it down in my, this thing. And any problem that came up where people would say, oh, you haven't done this, sorry. You know I haven't been trained. And I made it plain and clear. I'm here to learn, but there's a lot I don't know. So whatever you need, just try and help me to get to there. And because I've always been a solutions-focused person, a value-add person, a if that was my money, how would I feel person, it has paid off and continues to pay off. So I think that's the most detail I can give on that. Good afternoon. I have two questions. I make clothes, I went to learn tailoring, but then everybody's like, get a logo, get a brand name. But I always feel like it's not time yet. I want to ask, when is it time to have a brand name and a logo? And my second question is, I read a book one time and it said, if you don't leave that job you don't like, you cannot get the job you want. And I, if you leave the job and when you get out, you don't get the job you want, you stay one year, two years, what should you do? Thank you. Who do, who do you want to, you want me to address that? Yes, please. Okay. Logo, <laughs> logo, logo is my fee. Um, my darling, what's, what's the name? How do I purchase your clothes? Sure. Yes, I just, how do I purchase your, your clothes? My Instagram handle is Salvi D. I don't have a name yet, but then... Okay, so that's your first problem. And that's why you need a brand name and maybe a logo. It can be a simple thing. It can be your writing that you take a picture of and that becomes your logo. But if I don't have something to call your service or your product, how am I even going to find it? Because your service or your product is not you. You are not your service, you are not your product. It's a separate thing. So let, let it have its own platform, that's all. You may then get to a place where you're like, now it's time to 2.0 and 2.0, but you're at 70%, jump. There's no perfect time. There's never going to be a perfect time for the logo. What was Thanks. the second part? The okay. second part is, I read in a book that if you don't, if you don't leave, leave the what job. you are okay. doing that you don't like, you can't get what you desire. Right. But if you leave what you are doing and there is nothing else for you to do, what, what should you do? Okay. And you stayed a, longer, like a long period of time and you are still unable to get what you want. Um, I think trying to hedge your bets doesn't usually work that way. So if you're, if you're sitting... There's two ways to look at it, and there are caveats to that saying, right? That saying has context to it. Um, it's like a closed fist, right? Can't receive anything if it's closed, because there's something in here. But this is a risk. Opening your fist is a risk. Once you open it, that thing can fall out, and nothing else may come in. And that's a risk you're going to have to take if you want to grow. Now, have you spent enough time at that work to learn everything from that job? Why don't you like the job? You've got to think about what it is that you don't like about the job, versus what you can learn from it. If there's still things you can learn, including the fact that somebody's paying you and you don't pay anybody else yet, then figure out how your boss is able to work so that he can pay you. Figure out what systems are in place, what helps companies and organizations run as well as systems. Look at the discipline they've put in place and start applying those disciplines not for the person you work for, but for yourself. So that if you do decide to leap, and in that interim between leaping and finding another job that you actually want, you're able to, to instill discipline in your life so you continue functioning optimally. Does that, does that sort of make sense? Because, for example, okay, one of my brothers um, has gone, you know, lives and works in the UK. He was in Nigeria. Well, he used to work there, came to Nigeria, and then decided to go back. And I remember when he made the decision, um, my parents obviously being worried, were like, oh, are you sure? Should that happen? Blah, blah. Why don't you wait here till you get a job there? It doesn't work that way in the UK. They can call you up anytime to show up for an interview. And once they know that you're not in the country, they're really hesitant to hand over work to you. Just because it's not convenient. Client can show up, call anytime. We need this candidate to show up. You're not there to show up. So he had to leave, but it was calculated risk. It was okay. I'm going to save up for this amount of time. I have this amount of money here. This is the budget I'm going to live on per month. You've got to be disciplined. One of the biggest issues with young people is discipline and impatience. Whatever it is you want to do, wherever it is you want to be, it's going to take you time. And it's okay that it takes you time. Accept that it is taking you time. But make sure in the meantime, you are impacting discipline in your life so that you're noticing progress. It doesn't have to be big. If today, you manage, after leaving your full-time job, you manage to wake up 
at 8 a.m. as opposed to the 10 a.m. you've been waking up, good job. That's progress. And I'm saying this because we can also be very, very hard on ourselves. And when you talk really negatively to yourself all the time, you develop that ostrich syndrome. You no longer want to face the world. It's your coping mechanism. And if you don't allow other people to talk bad to you, catch yourself when you are talking bad to yourself. When you are saying negative things in your mind, you've got to stop it. And that only comes from paying attention, awareness, and every day asking yourself, what do I want? What is the small step I can take today to get there? It could be as little as waking up on time. It could be as little as eating the right thing. It could be as little as saying, do you know what? This project I've been saying I'll do, I'll do, I'll do. Let me dedicate five minutes each day to this project. Maybe it's adding the website name. Maybe it's finding where I can register a website domain. Maybe it's deciding which platform I want to put the website on. It doesn't matter. But if you do that, you'll progress. All right. Um, good afternoon, sir and ma. My question, and I'd like to ask you the first question, sir. Um, okay, so as someone who's been in the business of human resource and um, understanding the terrain and understanding how that um, there really are no jobs in Nigeria, you know, and the plight and the frustration of um, young persons so people go to school and come out and there's practically no job you know in fact i i have it on good authority that these days it's easier to move from a job to another than come from you know outside entirely to get a job i, I would want your thoughts generally and then what you'll say to you know the youth really basically since you interface with people that kind and all that then the next question can go to any of you um, in recent time also, I, I have seen people come very vocal and, you know, um, preach entrepreneuring, 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 entrepreneur, push it and push it. And some, sometimes you are on a job, you know, and then you feel already like, ah, looks like I'm missing it in life. Uh, how, how do we place all that with, so if you are on a job, you know, and you're comfortable and the hula baloo of get off this job, come go run your own thing and all that. What would you say to people that way? Thank you. Uh, let me have a go at it. I'll start from the second one again. <laughs> uh, because it also ties to what she was asking. Uh, I think the best strategy is to, like she said, what are you passionate about? What brings money to the table? And then what's your dream? It's always important that you have... I don't want to sound pessimistic, right? But experience has shown. There was a time I did what she was asking. I resigned from a job. I didn't have a clear direction about how I was going to get the other one. I thought I was going to run my own thing. And then everything hit zero. I started at the business center, had a number of machines and all of that, but everything is zero. But thank God, it was earlier on in life. I had not married, I had not had children, responsibilities were not this much. Okay, so it's always better. The best strategy for me that I would recommend to anybody that is thinking of a side hustle. So many years ago, we used to talk about conflict of interest. That if you're doing anything outside what you do, that you are conflicting. But as of today, in the world of HR, in the world of business, we recognize side also. However, it is called side also because it is a side by the side. So you should start building that thing while you're doing your job. Don't leave, like I said, I don't want to sound pessimistic, don't leave certainty for the uncertain. There are hard realities. Your economic re um, requirements will continue. So if you have a job, good for you. Continue to do that job whilst you are building that side also gradually. It will get to a point where it will require your full attention when it will also be able to pay your bills. At that time, nobody needs to tell you that you need to pull out from what you're doing 
and focus more on that side also. Entrepreneurship has its own challenges. Right? I'm happy she didn't tell us that she didn't struggle. There will always be that struggle. Right? Maybe 10% of those that started end up making it. There are statistics in Nigeria that a lot of people register. There's a statistic about how many businesses get registered in a year in Nigeria. And then there have been statistics about how many, what percentage of those, less than 10%, survive after three years. Okay? So, if you have a job that you're doing already, good for you. Please focus on it. Don't allow your side also distract or distract from what you're supposed to give your employer. But don't forget your side also. Coming back to your second question, I mean your first question now. Um, employability. So there are also statistics about um, how much employment are available and how much people get jobs. I don't agree that there are no jobs. There are jobs. There will always be jobs. Right? The question is how qualified, how suitable are people for those jobs? And when we call the, call the, I mean, talk about suitability, we are not necessarily talking about your qualification. If you remember, I said your degree is not a minimum requirement. It's the baseline. All right? Unfortunately for us, and it's, a, and it's a contentious topic, unfortunately for us, our schools continue to prepare people that are not exactly fit for the jobs that are available. The, syllabus, the syllabuses are not changing as frequently as the jobs are changing. Okay, so your prof is probably still using his, the same syllabus he had 30 years ago to teach in today's world. If you did computer science, they are still teaching you COBOL, they are still Fortran and all of that. Who uses those things anymore? <laughs> so that is where the problem is. Mm. So for every serious person, even before you leave school, it's important that you align your skill requirements with the skills requirements of the labor force, I mean of the labor market. And you look at how you want to bridge that gap, either by way of certifications or short courses. Don't rely on what you have been taught in school alone. It's important to come out with a good degree. That becomes the platform. That becomes your baseline. However, beyond that, you need to now add to yourselves other skills that will be required. For instance, it, 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 it used to be cool. Nobody bothered. If you say you come out and you are not computer savvy. Today, if you don't know how to use the full Microsoft Office, I won't hire you. Mm. Because it's going to require a lot of effort and money to bring you to the level that I want. I don't have that time. Especially because there are several other people that have actually developed themselves to that, to level. that level. Why should I waste my, 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 my value, my resources? On such a person. So it is important to know that it is not true that there are no jobs. What the reality is, the jobs that are available, a lot of us are not ready for, for those jobs. That is why you see that organizations that have the resources now bring people into their training school to upskill them to what they actually require. Mm. Well said. Fantastic. Round of applause for both uh, our speakers. Thank you so much, Dr. Peter and Folu. There's so many other questions, but they will be, sh I'm sure they'll be magnanimous enough to share their emails so you could send them, uh, you know, your questions uh, via email. Thank you again for your time, um, even as you exit.